am the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. And I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time. And here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? I know a riddle. That's a fine answer. I say, how are you today? And she says, I know a riddle. Oh, I'm fine. And now is it all right to tell you a riddle? Yes, what is the riddle? Why does the stork stand on one leg? To keep the other leg from wearing out. <laughs> that's funny, but that's not the answer. All right, then. Why does a stork stand on one leg? Because if he picked up the other leg, he would fall down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's very good. Now you tell me, what goes around a button? Oh, that's easy. A buttonhole goes around the button. Oh, that's true, but it's not the answer I'm looking for. Something else goes around the button. What? A billy goat goes around a button. <laughs> especially, especially when they bend over. <laughs> That's so funny. Now will you please read me the comic? Puck the comic weekly? Very well, I will in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for Hop Along. Hoppy and Doc Swayze were trapped in Nestor's shack, which the outlaws brand and Concha would set afire. Convinced that Hoppy and the Doc are done for, the outlaws head back to Buckskin to report to Doc Wiley, the leader of the Ghost Raiders. They see California, Lucky, and the sheriff heading toward them. Concho reaches for his gun. Brand exclaims, hey, Get your gun. Now paw off that gun, you fool. They've seen us. Let me do the talking. First picture next row, the sheriff rides up and says, We're looking for a gent dressed in black and riding a white mount. Brand answers, Spotted a man fitting that description not ten minutes ago. He's riding east toward Mesquite Flat. The sheriff and Hoppy's pals spur on. Brand lures. That ought to steer those snoopers clear of that blazing shack. In the meantime, Hoppy and Doc Swayze have found an unfinished tunnel under Nestor's shack. They escape burning alive by crawling back in the tunnel. But the smoke is getting thicker and thicker, suffocating them. Big picture, fourth row, their handkerchiefs over their faces, they feel their way through the smoke-filled passage. Suddenly, Hoppy's fingers touch a wooden object. Second picture, fifth row, he exclaims, Hey, Doc, look. Dynamite sticks. A whole box of them. I hope they're still good. Doc Swayze answers. Hey, they must have been here for years. Hoppy says, first picture, next row. Listen, judging by the direction, I think this tunnel dead ends just short of that river bend. Some of these sticks can either prove it or bury us. Well, it's risky, but we have no choice. So quickly, Hoppy sets the fuse, plants the dynamite at the end of the tunnel, lights it, and then he and Doc scurry back and throw themselves flat on the floor as Hoppy yells, last picture, fifth row. Get back, Doc. There she goes. First picture, bottom row. The explosion blows a hole in the bank of the old dried river bend. Last picture, California, some distance away, suddenly slows his horse and exclaims, Hey, didn't I just hear thunder? The sheriff, doing likewise, says... Well, whatever it was, it came from the north in the direction of Nestor's shack. We better check. The men turn their horses around and head toward Nestor's shack. Oh, goody. They're going to investigate. Yes. And I hope that Hoppy didn't get hurt in that explosion. Oh, we'll see. And if he didn't... If he didn't, then he and the sheriff will go after that mean old brand and Concho and Doc Wiley, and he'll catch them all and fix them good. And that's what we'll have to find out next week. Now? Well, now let's see if Prince Val is on page three. Very well, here we go to page three. And there he is. Yes. You remember last week, Arf and Val were on their way back home on a ship, and then Arf is still feeling very badly because he's lost a leg in an accident. Yes, Arf wanted to be a famous knight. 
And he doesn't believe he can be a great warrior if he only has one leg. So Prince Val has another idea to cheer up our... Yes, he's putting into another port with a plan in mind. Please read now and we can find out what it is. Very well, here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Heck it, break it, Gray Malkin and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> The ship rocks gently in a strange harbor, but Arf shows no interest. He's given way to despair and can only gaze with reddened eyes at his sword and shield. Prince Valiant enters the cabin. Well, come, lad, let's go ashore. You need exercise to regain your strength. Arf answers last picture top row. Of what use is strength to a cripple? To cut meat with my sword and use my shield as a platter? Val replies, first picture, next row. Why, there is still strength of heart, strength of mind. Good qualities, too, in a lad who would never have become a warrior. You see, Arf, I've known since I first practiced bout that you'd never be a great warrior. You have to think out every move, and the first natural swordsman you fought would slay you while you were thinking. Arf becomes very thoughtful and somewhat disappointed to hear these words about himself. And then, last picture, second row, Val says, The knight champion wins the applause, yes. But it is the wise man whose intelligence directs the destiny of nations. Trade your useless sword for books. Arf looks at Val, then looks down in deep thought. Val watches him for a second, seeing how these words sink into his head. And then he leaves the cabin and goes on deck, first picture bottom row. Val is sick with anxiety. Will this latest blow awaken his young friend or plunge him further into despair? And then there comes quite suddenly, last picture, an end to all Val's worries. Two passengers come aboard. And one of them is the medicine any doctor would prescribe for a sick young man, a beautiful young girl who Val intends that Arf shall meet. Oh, now maybe Arf will fall in love with the beautiful young girl. Well, I hope she'll fall in love with him and make him believe that love is the greatest thing in the world. Yes, and then maybe she will want to marry him. Yes, then Arf will find out that a beautiful girl isn't won only by brave deeds, but by brave thoughts. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yes. Well, next week we'll find out if that's what happens. Now let's turn over the page and see who's there. All right. Look, there's Flash Gordon. I'm very anxious to see what happens to Flash because you remember last week he's on a new expedition. Yes, Dr. Ruff and Flash are building a space platform a thousand miles away from the Earth in the air. And last week, uh, Dr. Ruff's niece, that's a girl named Ginger, slipped off the rocket ship and floated away into space. And then Flash went after her to try to help get her back. Mm -hmm. Because in space, far from Earth, their bodies are as light as clouds, and they don't fall. They just float lazily in space without any way of controlling themselves. But uh, I wonder if Flash will ever get back to the ship or if someone will save him. Well, let's read now and find out. So here we go with Flash Gordon. Rega rega doon doon, sask him a tash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Flash springs to the rescue of Ginger, who has been hurled off the space platform. Her momentum carries her so fast that Flash has to use his ray gun as a rocket to step up his speed. Slowly, he overtakes the girl, reaches out and grabs her. Last picture, top row, Ginger clutches him in blind terror, sobbing that they'll never get back. But Flash is too busy to answer. He aims his ray blast carefully to reverse their speed, hoping to catch up to the space island that is spinning in its orbit. Suddenly, first picture, bottom row, a weird saucer-shaped ship appears from nowhere and cuts between Flash and the vanishing space platform. As if guided by some evil brain, a plastic tube whips out to catch Flash and Ginger. They're pulled inside this strange craft by ugly little pygmies about three feet tall, creatures from another world who strip off Flash and Ginger's space helmets. Flash gasps, then tells Ginger, It's thin air, but we can breathe. Take it easy. We can't fight them yet. Last picture, Toxo, the leader, aims a ray gun at Flash's brain, then pulls the trigger. A cloud of gas surrounds Flash. Startled but unhurt, Flash now understands his captor's language. Toxo exclaims, Telepathy brain waves, so you can answer questions. How many Earthmen on your ship? What weapons? <laughs> Strange people. Yes, but in a way, that's better than floating away in space and being lost forever. 
Well, yes, because maybe Flash and Ginger can overcome them and then take their ship away from them and then get back to their friends. Well, let's hope that's what happens next week. Yes, I hope, hope so, too. Look, look right across the page. There's Donald Duckle, my favorite favorite. Very well, we'll read Donald Duckle. Say the magic words with me, please. Squeege him, squeege him, squid a chicka chack. Let's have music to fit a quack quack. Donald is sending his nephew Louie to the store to get some groceries, and he tells him potatoes, salt, beans, and wieners. Uh, maybe I better write it down for you. And Louie replies, Gee, I can remember four things. I'm not that dumb. So out the door he goes, and down the street. And in his mind are potatoes, salt, beans, and wieners. Fourth picture, he passes a friend who was eating an ice cream cone. And Louie says, Yum, yum, yum. And last picture, top row, and the potatoes are out of his mind. First picture, bottom row, he's thinking of ice cream, salt, beans, and wieners. Second picture, bottom row, he passes a girl licking a lollipop. Louie says, and the salt goes out of his mind. Third picture, bottom row, he sees a boy eating popcorn. And Louie goes, <laughs> and the beans are out of his mind. And in his mind now is ice cream, lollipop, popcorn, and wieners. Just as he goes into the store, a boy comes out eating donuts. And... Last picture, Donald's phone rings. When he answers it... Hello? Louie answers... Say, Uncle Donald, are you positive you want ice cream, candy, popcorn, and donuts for supper? <laughs> Wasn't that funny? He said he could remember four things, and then when he got to the store, all he could think of were the delicious things that his friends were eating. <laughs> yes, it just goes to prove it's always a good idea for little boys and girls to write down what they are sent to the store for. <laughs> you are so right. <laughs> well, now it's time for Dagwood and Blondie. And here they are on the first page of the second section. And you're so right, and I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Ramafu, ramafum, zim, zam, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Today is the boss's birthday. Dagwood calls Blondie on the phone and tells her, Blondie, it's the boss's birthday. We're going to give him a surprise party at the office. Blondie says she'll bring the decorations from Alexander's party. And Dagwood says... Bring uh, balloons and the paper hats, too. Last picture, top row, in the office, Dagwood tells his friends, Blondie is coming with all the stuff right away. And one of the friends answers, Fine, fine, we'll decorate his office while he's at the bank. <laughs> First picture, next row, Mr. Dithers is at the bank trying to borrow some money, and he's saying, I need a $20,000 loan immediately, Mr. Grunt, for expansion purposes. Mr. Grunt replies, Impossible, Mr. Dithers. Money is tight these days. Mr. Dithers drops to one knee and implores, Well, if you would just come up to my office and see how efficiently my business is run, you'll change your mind. Mr. Dithers takes Mr. Grunt by the hand, leads him out the office, last picture the row, saying, Please come. You'll be impressed by the business-like manner of my employees. You're just wasting my time, Mr. Dithers. <laughs> First picture, third row, Mr. Dithers brings Mr. Grunt into his office, expecting him to show him everybody hard at work. As he opens the door, he sees balloons and ribbons hanging from the chandelier. On his desk is a cake and 45 presents. And then the office floor sings, We, we wish, wish you a happy birthday, birthday to the old boss. Mr. Dithers looks nervously at Mr. Grunt, and Mr. Grunt glares at Mr. Dithers, then stalks out of the office. Whereupon, Mr. Dithers leaps at Dagwood with a baseball bat. Dithers beats up on Dagwood. Last picture of the row saying, It's your fault, Mumpset. Your nonsense cost me $20,000. 
Suddenly, first picture, bottom row, the office boy rushes in and says, Hey, come quick, Mr. Dithers. Your banker friend is out in the hall crying his heart out. Dithers dashes out of the office to see what's the matter with Grunt. There finds Mr. Grunt wiping his tears with $1,000 bills, and Grunt sobs, The warm affection your employees hold for you touches my heart so deeply that I'm going to grant you the loan. And he holds the bills out to Mr. Dithers, who chortles, Oh, how delicious. And then Mr. Grunt goes. Last picture, Mr. Dithers, his arms full of money, bends over and says cheerfully, Okay, everybody on the force, line up and give me a big, swift kick. And Dagwood pulls his foot back, ready to give Mr. Dithers a good kick, and says, Hey, this is going to be fun. We We wish wish you a happy birthday. (laughs) Oh, wasn't that wonderful? (laughs) That's one time that Dagwood's plans worked out very well. Yes, Mr. Grunt at first thinks no one is doing their work seriously and decides not to give them the money. And then he decides that Mr. Dithers must be a wonderful employer in order to be given such a fine party. (laughs) Yes, well, then he decides to give him the money. Oh, that's so funny. (laughs) Oh, now will you please read Roy Rogers? Here he is, right below Dagwood and Blondie. I certainly will. Do you remember last week that Dick Dolan, that mean outlaw, had followed Roy home? And Dolan doesn't have a gun now, but he's after Roy with a pitchfork, and he was going to stick it right in Roy's back when Trigger nade suddenly. And Roy turned around, and there was Dolan facing him with a pitchfork. Please read now and see what happens. Very well. Here we go with Roy Rogers, king of the cowboys. hi yip hi Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. hi yip hi <laughs> Dolan snarls. I ain't got a gun, Rogers, but this pitchfork will fix you good and proper. He throws the pitchfork. Roy quickly ducks. The prongs of the pitchfork just miss puncturing Roy's arm, but they pin him against the corral. Dolan snarls. Missed your gizzard, Rogers, but your gun arm won't be much good now. He runs for a horse and gallops away. Third picture, he calls back. That'll hold you while I pick up the trail of killer Monty, the double-crossing mass tenderfoot of slug me. Roy pulls the fork out of the post and runs for Trigger. Nancy, the girl from the city, and her uncle Quincy, who's Roy's bookkeeper, come running up to see what happened. Last picture, top row. Nancy asks Roy what's happened. Roy yells, That was Dick Dolan, Nancy, the gunman who helped kill him on. He slipped through my fingers. I've got a score to settle with them both. Keep an eye on Trigger Jr. till I get back, and don't let anybody steal him again. And he gallops off. First picture, bottom row, Uncle Quincy sees the red bandera lying on the ground. He picks it up, saying, Hey, Nancy, where did this bandera come from? Nancy tells him Roy must have dropped it and that Roy suspects it belongs to the masked outlaw, Killer Monty. A moment later, Uncle Quincy is in his office. He's put on his chaps, strapped a gun to his waist, and is saying, This is my chance to show Roy I'm something besides a pencil pusher with my nose stuck in a ledger. And he's tying the bandera around his face. And the door opens, and in comes his niece, fourth picture bottom row. She exclaims, Uncle Quincy! Well, you're Killer Monty. Uncle Quincy grabs her arm, last picture, saying, Well, it's high time Roy found out that Quincy Montgomery can do something else besides juggle figures. Well, no wonder Roy thought Trigger Jr. was stolen. It was Uncle Quincy who was trying to prove to Roy that he was a dangerous man. I think that's so silly. It is. And now Uncle Quincy is going off to help Roy capture Dick Dolan. Well, if Dolan sees him, Dolan's apt to kill him dead because he knocked Dolan out before when he was going to kill Roy. Yes. This could cause a lot of trouble for Roy. But we'll find out more about it next week. Well, now is it time for Dick's adventure? It is indeed, so let's turn over the page. And there he is on page three. Oh, I just love this because Dick is with Daniel Boone in the early days of America. And it's so exciting. Yes, last week Daniel Boone and Dick and some men had gone out to rescue some surveyors. But the men had become tired and had stopped to camp for the night. And in the middle of the night... Daniel Boone, followed by Dick, slipped off to rescue the other party that was left. And just after they were gone, the Indians began to slip up on the camp that Boone had just left. And everybody's asleep, so please read to me. I'm anxious to know what's happened. Very well. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. riggedy pack a zack a zack Let's have music for adventurous Dick. American surveying parties are being slaughtered by desperate bands of red warriors in the wild Kentucky backwoods country. With one party still deep in the forest, Dick and Daniel Boone search all night for their camp. 
Boone's young son, Jim, remains behind with a number of exhausted survivors. Dawn brings them to the campsite and a ghastly welcome. The camp has been destroyed and all the white men have been killed. There is nothing Boone can do. So last picture top roll, with no sign that the warriors are around, they start cautiously back to the spot where Boone's son and the survivors were left. At this very moment, while Boone is heading back, others reach the camp before him. It's the Indians who attack the sleeping searching party. They show no mercy for young or old. The white settlers who are awakened are greatly outnumbered. They haven't a chance. The entire camp is destroyed. Hours later, when Boone reaches the camp, he and Dick get a ghastly welcome. But this time, it is Boone's own son who is numbered among the victims. Dick watches, tears in his eyes, as Boone silently carries his dead son in his arms and lays him on some leaves nearby. Then, quickly, Boone and Dick go to work to dig graves for the dead. First picture, bottom row, Dick and Daniel Boone, alone in the forest, stand before the grave of Boone's son. Boone prays, but he doesn't weep. And the blood of his kith and kin lies buried in the soul of Kentucky. Then, with Dick at his side, Boone returns to the tiny frontier settlement of Boonesboro. He tells the sad news to the people in the small settlement and all those who have lost husbands or sons. And he gives comfort to his wife, who is heartbroken at the death of her son, a woman whose loss is as great as his own. Last picture, before the sun rises again, Dick and Boone are once more deep in the forest wilderness. And now their one mission is to bring justice to Kentucky. It certainly was. But now Daniel Boone is going out to punish the Indians for the cruel things they did. Yes, he is. And the Indians deserve it because it was senseless killing to have murdered all those white people. Yes. I hope he gets them and just fixes them good. Yeah, but don't forget, though, he's riding into great danger himself. And we'll find out more about that next week. All right. And now, will you please read me Rusty Riley? Here he is, right below Dick's Adventures. You remember someone had been stealing some oats from the feed bin, and no one can figure out who's doing it. But last week, the little girl came to get some laundry in a coaster wagon, and Rusty has discovered some grains of oats on the floor after her wagon has pulled away. And I wonder whether she has a pony or something that she's stealing the oats for. Well, let's find out right now. So here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Rusty looks at the oats that are lying on the floor where the coaster wagon had been standing just a moment ago, and he says to himself, Jeepers, could it be possible that the little girl Queenie's the one who's swiping the feed? He says to Flip, his dog, third picture, Well, she sure wouldn't be eating oats and mash herself. Wait, though, maybe she's got some chickens. Then he decides to investigate. He asks Pete, the feed boss, Hey, Pete, do you know Queenie's folks? Where do they live? Pete replies, Oh, so that's the way it is, eh? Interested in little Miss Queenie, eh? Well, they live in a shanty in the north edge of the woods. So off Rusty goes, following the girl. He gets within sight of her, last picture, top row. He says, Jeepers, there she goes. If she's the one who's been taking the feed, I'd sure like to know what she does with it. He takes her, he sees her take a shortcut through the woods. First picture, bottom row. The path twists and turns. He tries to get a little closer. And then suddenly discovers that she has disappeared. Then Flip, last picture, starts off a little path leading sideways through the trees. Rusty exclaims, Hey, come back here, Flip. What are you after, a rabbit or something? And then he exclaims, Jeepers, there's a kind of branch path down into that gully. Oh, I'll bet you that Flip is following where the little girl is going. And you know, she went into a little place down there, and I'll bet you that's she's hiding what it is that she's hiding. You know what? What? I'll bet you're right about whatever you're right about. Yes. Well, next week we'll find out more. 
Now, next, now shall we read Uncle Remus? Oh, yes, please. Very well. Turn over the page, go past Jungle Jim, past Perry Mason and the Lone Ranger, turn over another page, and there on page six is Uncle Remus and his tales of Br'er Rabbit. Say the magic words with me. Hippity hoppity, make, make it a habit to give, give us music for old Br'er Rabbit. <laughs> Uncle Remus says, This is a tale about Br'er Fox a catching Br'er Rabbit with his clothes on a hickory limb. Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Terrapin are out in the pond having a little swim when suddenly Br'er Rabbit sees Br'er Fox coming toward him and he exclaims, Uh-oh, there's Br'er Fox. He's caught me. Br'er Terrapin whispers something in Br'er Rabbit's ear. Okay. And then he dives under the water. Third picture top row, Br'er Fox on shore says cheerfully, Well, if it ain't Br'er Rabbit all by his all alone self. And Br'er Rabbit answers, Now wait, Br'er Fox, you is to take an unfair advantage. Br'er Fox starts to come wading into the water, licking his chops, first picture bottom row. Br'er Rabbit says, Now keep away, Br'er Fox, keep away. The alligators will get you. Br'er Fox answers, Yuck, 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 yuck. How come the alligators ain't getting you? Ha, ha, ha. At that moment, at the bottom of the pond, next picture, Br'er Terrapin is saying to two little crawfish who have huge pincer claws, All right, Br'er Crawfish, you boy, do your stuff. And the two little crawfish snap their claws on Br'er Fox's foot. He yells, Help, 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 a alligator's got me. And Br'er Rabbit says, last picture, Don't worry, Br'er Fox, you let go the next time it thunders. And Uncle Remus says... You can think your way into trouble as easy as stepping into it. (laughs) (laughs) That's really funny. Bear Fox is being pitted by a little tiny crawfish, and he thinks the alligators have got him. Yes, Bear Terrapin certainly outfoxed him that time. (laughs) I just love him. Yes, and they'll be here next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. and all you boys and girls. I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Connie Wiggly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend Miss Honey next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the Jolly Comic Weekly Man.